Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, expert cattlemen and leaders from Dow AgriSciences discuss the benefits of effective forage and pasture management programs, plus products available to help cattlemen combat difficult weeds. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Thanks for joining us. Grazing high quality 4-H has always been a low cost feed source for cattlemen. And when you consider factors like low hay supplies, high corn prices and fewer grazing acres, it's more important today than ever before. We're sitting down with leaders from Dow AgriSciences as well as expert cattlemen to discuss the importance of forage management and the value of high quality forage. Joining me in the studio today are Dave Owens, he's the portfolio marketing leader with Dow AgriSciences, Pat Birch, a field scientist also with Dow AgriSciences, Mike D, he manages D River Ranch in Aliceville, Alabama, and Mike's also a past regional winner of the Environmental Stewardship Award, and Daryl Oswald from Oswald Ranch in Wing, South, uh, North Dakota. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming to the show. Well, before we get started uh, into our discussion, let's hear from a few cattlemen about their views on forage management and the impact it has had on the success of their own operations. A few times I met my wife's grandfather before he passed away, uh, he, he spent more time driving me around this place, looking out the window, chewing on a cigar, looking at various types of grass and not showing me cattle. And I thought, well, hey, you're a cowboy, where's the cows? But he, he impressed on me very early on how important it was to spend your money and your time growing a good, good uh, you know, pastures full of grass. That's your cheapest feed for your cattle. Let them harvest the grass for you so you don't have to purchase as much hay or purchase feed. That'll really get you into trouble. First of all, you have to have the grasses to be able to have the stock on it. Um, I want to rate the land. I'm, at first, I'm a grass farmer. We grow grass, then comes the cattle. I love uh, native grasses. Uh, they're a lot better as far as some of this soil is real tight soil and it's compacted. Uh, the native grasses tend to do better in it and they take a lot less fertilizer. Uh, at least it's just, it's just way, the way it was before man came here. So I love the native grasses and, and the cattle do good on it. They're gonna do good on everywhere, anywhere you put them. Grass is the most important thing we do. I mean, I think we're in the grass business, not the cattle business. Uh, you gotta have grass to grow, raise cattle. Um, and you know we're very fortunate where we're at. You can see we have a lot of Bahia pastures, and um, we try to maintain them the best we can. We just we're actually fertilizing right now, um, trying to have the best grass that we can. That's we're, we're grass farmers. You can see that they're taking uh, they're taking a lot better care of their places, and they've always taken good care of them. I mean they've always tried to do what's right for the land and stuff. Um, I think they're spraying more now than what they would have five years ago because they're they're kind of doing like me. I mean, they're, they're trying to grow some grass, feed a little less. If we grow some extra forage, we can go in there and cut it for hay. And uh, if we're in a, in a normal rainfall year, what that is, we don't know. I mean, it's been so different. Um, but yeah, we like to, I'd, I'd rather grow standing forage like these cattle are on and protein them and, and my goal is to feed these cows three rolls of hay per year. I don't want to start feeding really till January 1st. So I'm, I'm a little harder on them than most people around here are, but I'm, I'm trying to, to cut my cost down because the hay is the biggest expense we have. Grass is number one, so now price of feeding cows has gone up because price of corn's gone up. So grass has become even more important the last five, six years. So grass has become even ever more important. So we do more and more and more to try to raise, you know, and produce more grass than we have in the past. We kind of took it for granted for a little bit, but now it's, 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 it's high on the list. As expensive as what our grassland is becoming, we have to graze. We have to use every acre and we have to be able to um, be able to run that five acres for cow calf for the season. Otherwise it just gets so cost prohibitive. 
Obviously, forage is very important to these cattlemen and many others around the country. So let's jump into our discussion, gentlemen. And Dave, I'd like to start with you. You talked to a lot of cattlemen in your role. Um, is this drought still causing cattlemen to focus a lot on, on being better at, at producing and managing their forage? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the USDA came out with some statistics that are very interesting. And I've been in this uh, business for about three decades now, and I rarely get the opportunity to say uh, that happened before my time. Mm -hmm. But uh, USDA has said that uh, we've got the lowest on-farm feedstocks, hay supplies, uh, since 1955. Wow. Um, we got into a huge drought. It uh, impacted about three quarters of uh, our nation's mama cows. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get into a situation like that, not only do they consume a lot of the forage that's already on the ground, but they consume a lot of the stocks that you have as, as safety supplies. Sure. So it's really made folks sit up and take notice that we've got to be a little bit better and more aggressive in managing our forage uh, forages for situations just like this. You know, a year ago we sat in the studio here and talked about high corn prices and the impact they were having. We haven't seen a lot of relief in that category yet. Uh, what are grain prices doing to the importance people place on, on producing forage? Oh, Kevin, that's a, a huge concern. Um, one of the situations that we're faced with is as you move cattle into a feed yard, uh, it gets very expensive to feed them on a corn-based ration. Mm -hmm. uh, putting a dollar's worth of a uh, pound of beef on uh, a calf uh, in a feedlot costs you about a dollar twenty-five. We can get that same pound of beef put on in a pasture situation for about 50 cents. So when you do the math, it's a no-brainer that these folks really need to focus on producing more low-cost cheap forage. And I want to talk to our producers about that. Uh, Mike, let's begin with you. What role does forage play in your operation down south? Um, you know, we, we can grow a lot of forage, Kevin. We're a cow-calf operation. We also are a grain operation. We raise our own corn. And, and with cheaper corn, back we used to supplement some of our own grain we raised to make up for shortfalls in our forage program and at different times. But with the expense we have now in raising that corn crop and the value that corn is, you know, we've turned a lot more to trying to feed the grass and, and go to a more a forage base where we don't have to have the high input of, of a grain supplement to, to complement our operation. And, and Darrell, what about your operation? Well, Kevin, uh, forage is a huge thing. Our whole operation is based on that. And obviously we want to try to increase our forage base by focusing on soil health. And if we can extend the grazing season, and keep our cattle out on the land longer, uh, you know, we're going to save costs and we won't have to feed the high priced corn and the other grains uh, that we need. So that's how it's affecting us. And, and you know, Dave talked a little bit about uh, the changes that we've seen in our industry in a number of regards. Um, do you think about forage differently today than you did, say, five years ago, Daryl? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we started to make the, the big transition into thinking more holistically back in 2006. And we, our emphasis was to, you know, r increase rest and recovery on our pastures, and uh, and put the emphasis on back on the soil health, uh, taking care of the land, and it takes care of us. Mike, what what would you add? Um, you know, it, the most efficient way to harvest forage is, is with that animal, that livestock. We've we've looked at that a lot more, trying to put up less hay do a little more of harvesting through that livestock. And, you know, with the, the higher price of livestock, it, it's a little easier to justify making improvements, improving pastures, making a better forage. My Dow rep, local Dow rep, has really helped me save a lot of money. And, you know, when we really look at that weed is when it's seeding out. Hmm. And that's when I want to try to kill it. Well, he says, you know, I could get more bang for my buck if we go through a plan spend the same amount of money where I can get the most benefit out of it before, before those weeds are there, and then I can feed the forage with some fertilizer and, and not lose it in, in that weed that's out there. Well, I, and I want to follow up on that. Um, tell me, guys, uh, about some of the pro uh, production practices you put in place in your own operations uh, to maximize forage production. Daryl, you want to start? With building our intensive grazing management system, of course, cross fences are, are uh, a vital tool in what we do, pipelines, putting in water points, those types of things. With the cross fences and the pipelines and the waters, we can build in the rest and recovery thing. 
we've got pastures where we have our whole herd of cattle on only for three days. That pasture is then rested close to 400 days. Yeah. Uh, we're building the resource, we're building better roots, we're producing more grass. Uh, that's how it all comes together for us. And Mike, you mentioned one of the things you're doing relative to, to weed management, but tell us more. Um, you know, I'm with Daryl a lot and get more rotational grazing where, where we can be more intensive with our inputs, but we have to be more intensive with our harvest. So we have to get those cattle on the grass when it's the right stage, get them back off and, and get the, utilize it to its best potential. We, we tend to have some rolling ground, heavy clay ground, and you know, I can, can run them on the rolling ground in the wintertime, mm -hmm. take them to some flatter ground in the summertime where we don't have so much moisture, mm -hmm. and, and really try to utilize the potential we have, the, utilize the forage we have to its best potential. So I'm interested, what are the key challenges you face in, in managing your forage production, Mike? Um, we're a very cyclical growing. We can grow nine to, to 10 months out of the year, but there's some real highs and lows in our forage base program, so we have to either stockpile some standing grass to, to get through those times, harvest some of the excess at other times, put up some hay. You know, we don't want to have to put up any more hay than we, than we have to, but we need some as an insurance policy to make it through some tighter times. But, but really, like right now going into the spring, I'm going to have a real flush of grass. I've got to have the cattle ready to use that in shape, and, and before, before they get down, control that, that body condition score and, and keep them in good shape all year. Don't, don't let it cycle with that year. And Daryl, you, you uh, ranch in a little different country. You're not seeing a flush of grass, you're seeing a white blanket of snow. But what are some of the challenges you face? Well, that is probably one of the biggest challenges is our length of cold and winter. And of course, the hay and stuff that we have to produce to keep those animals alive. That's uh, our largest cost by far. And if we can extend the grazing season, and use our grazing systems and things to stockpile forages, hmm. uh, planting cover crops to improve soil health on our cropland when it's applicable, helps us extend the grazing season. And so we can shorten up that winter feeding period hmm. and that what's, which helps makes us more profitable. Absolutely. Pat, you know, we've talked a whole lot about drought on this show for the last couple of years, really, unfortunately. And uh, what are some things that you would recommend as, as people begin trying to recover from the drought? Yeah, it seems like there's a drought somewhere all the time. And that's one of the things that we try to do is we try to monitor our grazing lands and so that we, we begin to scout them. Uh, oftentimes after a drought, uh, the grass is, is set back, it's hurt for, uh, for a period of time. You're creating space for weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, weeds are very opportunistic, especially annual weeds. And so, uh, or biennials even. Mm -hmm. But you, you'll tend to look for those in the early part of the spring, trying to, uh, you know, get them under control mm -hmm. so that you can capture the site with your forage grasses that gives them a better stronghold. And tell me more about the role weed and brush management plays in that and specifically some recommendations potentially. Yeah, well, the, the, the key is to try to get those weeds under control and then you have to integrate, in some cases, uh, d depending on the severity of the, of the drought, you may have to plant some grasses in there. And so the, your, your weed control timing then has to be put in place uh, that it's gonna optimize the, uh, the control of the weeds and minimal impact on grasses, giving them a better chance to, to capture the site. So whether it's a fall, uh, cool season grass or, or uh, spring planting for warm season grass, you've gotta time that application so that you optimize the grass response and get those weeds under control so the grass can capture the site. That's what you want to, to hold on to it. Similar to what Mike was telling us. Dave, um, what does growing more forage <clears throat> mean to producers? Well, it, it kind of goes back to uh, flexibility for the overall uh, operation. You know, there's the old adage, uh, indecision is the key to flexibility, right? right? Well, not really. Uh, trying to be, be decisive and uh, getting yourself set to uh, take advantage of uh, early uh, rainfall and the like, and, and as Pat kind of said, going in there and really making that choice to be aggressive with your forage recoveries and, and, and forage management uh, type programs will really help you out in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, once you build that forage base, once you get 
uh, those grasses coming on and recovering, uh, it allows you to be flexible. It, mm. You can run more cattle, increase uh, your stocking rates, uh, produce more beef. Um, as Daryl said, you can choose to stockpile mm. forage mm -hmm. for later uh, on in the season. Mm -hmm. Also, you get better grazing distribution. So maybe you rotate your pastures a little bit differently uh, than you have. Hmm. But it all starts with that very assertive first decision to be aggressive about a forage management plan and getting one developed for your operation. Mike, maybe you could explain more about some of the things you've done to, to, to be more aggressive in that forage management plan. You know, we, we hit on grain prices going up, but the other one we hadn't mentioned is, is our fertilizer costs are, are astronomical. With, with these input costs going up, you've got to manage better. We have got to be able to get a return and see that return that we're getting. We don't put out cheap fertilizer anymore. It's all expensive. So we don't want to waste any of that. Mm -hmm. So before we try to fertilize, we try to clean up a pasture and make sure we're fertilizing that grass where we can recover it back in, in livestock in a product that we're going to sell. Yeah. You know, I can't, I'm always trying to improve our pastures, improve our row crop land. It's, it's building the soil a lot like Daryl says, but you you can you have a limited amount of assets you can use and, and get recoup your value. And Daryl, I'm intrigued by some of the things that you said relative to, to the, the, the experimentation you've done in various cover crops and, and intensive grazing systems. Tell us more about some of those practices that have improved your forage production capacity. Well, the cover crops have been really a key for us, uh, Kevin, because we're using seven and eight way mixes, sometimes even 10 way mixes, and we're expanding on those. And there we're able to, the big key there is, is, is we may be planting a forage crop first and then following it with a cover crop, mm -hmm. which adds to our grazing season. And it, it, it's building the soil health, mm -hmm. it's speeding up the soil biology, and it's allowing us to lower our inputs, not use maybe any fertilizer or, or very little, and get the boost that we need to see to produce uh, you know, our grain crops that we do produce. And Mike, um, if you can produce ample forage, how does that impact your decision making? Uh, what, what are you able to do better or differently when you're able to produce that ample forage? Oh, it, it, it's going into that planning stage of, I know how many cattle I can run, how many units. It, it puts it a little easier where we'll run cattle a little longer before we ship them west, get those, the cost of gain down because we're gaining on forage instead of grain and put that whole animal at more value to myself and to the, the end processor. And what does ample forage supplies mean to you, Dale? Well, you can build flexibility in your management of your resources. Mm -hmm. It's all about flexibility, like keeping, be able to keep your cattle longer, be able to graze them longer, uh, being able to keep them out on the land, mm -hmm. uh, changing season of use, and using the livestock as a tool to, to uh, emulate nature. If you have the forage and you can manage those cattle to their best potential, you're not behind the eight ball as much. Yeah, absolutely, and to Dave's point, there's been a real premium for, for getting some weight put on cattle before you get them in the feed yard, so there's been lots of, lots of uh, good benefits in that regard. Guys, this is a wonderful discussion. I'm anxious to ask you a few more questions. Ahead on this special edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll have more expert tips on the benefits of strong forage and pasture management programs. Plus, a look at the equipment available to cattlemen to help keep their pastures in tip-top condition. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. cost forage and improve grazing access by clearing out weeds and brush with these Dow AgroSciences herbicides. See your Dow AgroSciences representative or visit rangeandpasture.com.
To stay up to date on beef industry news and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, check out beefusa.org. You'll find news on both the Federation of State Beef Councils and the work of NCBA on Capitol Hill. Plus, link to NCBA programs like the blog, Beltway Beef, updates on the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show, and the latest from NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Connect today at beefusa.org. At Merck Animal Health, we are dedicated to improving the health and well-being of animals through innovative science-based solutions, products, treatments, and services to ensure a dependable, affordable food supply. From cattleman to consumer, from farm to family, we're with you every step of the way. We work where you work. What drives you drives us. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Welcome back to this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. This week we're sitting down with experts from Dow AgriSciences as well as fellow cattlemen to talk about the importance of forage management. We've had a great discussion so far and Pat I want to pick it up with you. Why do weeds and brush encroach pasture in the first place? Yeah well one of the things we talked about earlier is a drought. I mean that's usually a good setup. Anytime you you thin your forage base uh, something's going to come in there as soon as the the rain comes and uh, so you know as you get that moisture back a lot of times the opportunistic weeds are the ones that are going to come in but the other thing it could be an indication of is a fertility issue mm. um, sometimes those are the species you know the species that you see to show up out on a site and uh, the thinning of your your desirable forage grasses are, are an indication that there's a fertility problem and uh, you know so th those are the kinds of uh, of issues that uh, that can can demonstrate a problem, but also uh, grazing management, overgrazing a site, oftentimes that is uh, the, the one thing that will, will cause a lot of issues. If, if your fertility is not a problem, if you're in good uh, condition, moisture condition, but if you start to see some problems as a result of overgrazing. As those weed patches grow, then that puts more pressure on the adjacent prop, uh, pieces of land mm -hmm. and uh, and so then that puts more pressure on the grass as well. So once we've identified that we have a problem, be it weed or, or, or brush or what have you, uh, what guidance would you give us in terms of how do we make sure we choose the right product at the right time for the, the challenge that we're facing? Yeah, and, and Mike sort of alluded, alluded to that earlier when he was talking about his timing of application. Oftentimes if you're out there and you're seeing the weed as a problem, it may be too late. Uh, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of its damage. So to the inventory that site, uh, to, to keep records, uh, set goals for your pastures, uh, but to inventory those sites and recognize there was a problem here last year or there was a problem here before coming out of a drought with, with biennial thistles. And, and so you, you anticipate that and you scout those sites and you do your inventory and you select your herbicide uh, appropriately to, to manage that site. As you look at the different type of herbicide selections, you know, it, using something with residual control so that if you're out there making an application to a, an early season biennial thistle, but you know that there's going to be another problem coming in later, some of the annuals or some of the later emerging perennials like horse nettle, then if you have a residual herbicide, meaning that it not only works as a foliar herbicide, but it also works from, from root uptake, then you can oftentimes uh, control some of those weeds and give that grass an additional amount of time, I guess, to get that bump. Well, the drought certainly has created some challenges, and last year ranchers in the southwest got a chance to try Sendero. And this year, with mesquite control season rapidly approaching, they'll have the opportunity to put it to work in larger areas. Let's learn a little bit more about the new standard in mesquite control. Are you open to a new way to stop mesquite? Do you want to open more of your rangeland to grazing? Open your eyes to the new standard in mesquite control, Sendero Herbicide from Dow AgroSciences. Sendero clears the way to more grazing land for livestock and more fringe habitat for wildlife. 
In the American Southwest, Mesquite is the rancher's arch rival. It's some constant battle we're fighting. You know, these mesquites are so fast. The canopies get so big, we can't grow grass. Mesquite can wall off entire sections of rangeland from grazing. Its deep tap root pulls up water during lengthy droughts that wipe out more desirable plants. We're constantly spraying mechanical treatment, you know, everything in the arsenal. We try to maintain it at a decent level. This stuff gets out of hand. It's really difficult for us to gather our cattle out of the pasture. Old mesquite control methods can consume a lot of time and money without solving the problem. Mechanical methods damage native grasses and they're labor intensive. And many herbicides affect only top growth, promoting even thicker resprouting from the underground basal bud zone. No matter what you do, uh, it, it's coming back. You know, it's, it's so hard to kill. It's very prolific. Now, Dow AgroSciences introduces Sendero to control mesquite. In aerial trials, Sendero provided control at more than 10 percentage points better than a mixture of Remedy Ultra and Reclaim herbicides, which has been the industry standard for 25 years. So with the new product that we've got coming out, Sendero, um, I think it's gonna uh, open some doors that, that maybe we haven't had in the past. Across the board, we were getting, you know, on the average, about 60% root kill with reclaiming remedy. And we were able to up that to 70, 72% root kill on the average with the new combination that outperforms any other combination of herbicides that we tested. One of the big issues we've, we've, we've always faced is the consistency uh, with the control. That's one thing we're really hoping with this new Sendero product is if we can tighten that consistency and get some better results. We significantly reduced the variability in those plots in terms of uh, the amount of kill that we rated in those plots. So that's, that's, a, that's a big plus. Sendero is the most consistent chemical control of mesquite ever. It's 40% more consistent than a mixture of Remedy Ultra and Reclaim. I'm really looking forward to this new Sendero product. Uh, just another tool in our toolbox to attack things with. Got the high hopes for it. I think it's, I think it's gonna work. Sendero does not harm desirable grasses, including native grasses. It translocates to the roots and bud zone more quickly and completely than other products. To maximize root kill, apply Sendero during certain time periods: 42 to 63 days and 72 to 90 days after bud break. On the days in between, when beans are immature and flowers are white herbicides will not be translocated to the roots. So Sendero should be applied before beans are visible or after they are fully elongated. Also, soil temperatures on the date of application must be above 75 degrees at a depth of 12 inches or more. It's imperative to us and, and the ranch and the wildlife and everybody involved to get this brush sprayed, get these open areas opened up bigger, get it all to where benefits everybody. Clear the way for more consistent mesquite control with new Sendero. Dow Agro Sciences are the range and pasture specialists. Now for more information on Sendero and how it might help you on your operation, just log on to rangeandpasture.com. We'll continue our discussion on the benefits of forage management when we return. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is yours. And so is what grows there. Not theirs or theirs. Yours. You need this to fight this and this to grow more this. Because the more of this you feed them, the less this you spend on that which leaves more of this here. Don't let them take this from you. Chaparral takes care of weeds and brush, and that's that. You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. 
Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. And New Holland round balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland round balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. Welcome back. ATVs are almost as common as cattle on many operations around the country, and they're also a popular pasture improvement tool. Treating pastures doesn't have to be a big job with big equipment treating large tracks, but in order to get the most out of your ATV spray rig, it's important to set it up properly before you head out to spray your pasture. Here in the studio with us today, we have Pat Birch. He's a field scientist with Dow AgriSciences. Pat, last year you brought some backpack sprayers and a little smaller equipment, and this year we've stepped up a bit. Yeah, we have stepped up a bit, yeah. This is a very common piece of equipment we find on farms and ranches, and uh, the, the, the neat thing about it is it becomes a very flexible piece of equipment for, for using um, to spray your pastures. Sure. This one is set up a little bit different than traditional sprayers. If you think about like a truck mounted or a tractor mounted sprayer, oftentimes we have a fixed boom. Sure. So there may be 10, 15 feet on either side a boom sticking out. There's a problem with that, and, it, and especially when we're spraying rough pastures. You can yeah. be snagging it on things, uh, brush, rocks. Um, Fences. <laughs> sometimes if you get a little tilted, it can dig into the ground. Yeah. So those are just some uh, problems of dealing with a, a fixed boom type application. Now, okay. you can put a fixed boom on this right. for, for certain situations that you want to spray with. But uh, this one right now is rigged with a boomless setup. Oh. And the boomless setup gives you a, a lot more flexibility for spraying different canopy heights, um, uh, you know, kind of on rough terrain where you get tilted a bit. This one is set up, as I said, with a boomless setup. It has two spray nozzles okay. back here. What's the width of those then? These will each spray about 15 feet. Oh. So 15 feet left, 15 feet right. And then uh, the beauty of that is you have your uh, controls here. You can right. shut off one side. So if you needed to spray down a fence row, for instance, mm -hmm. you could make that application just on one side of the rig. That and so that, that makes it uh, a, a given another little uh, bit of flexibility for it. Right. All your controls here are right. operated mm -hmm. on the left-hand side because the operator is going to use the throttle for the right hand. Sure. Uh, pressure gauges are here. The other thing that ah. we have with it is a handgun, handgun sure. yeah, for spot spraying. So oftentimes you may come across brush that's taller and you have the flexibility of using something like this to spray that. Now I've noticed a saddle tank type system. I've not seen this before. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the whole idea of this is to get the weight down, I see. forward and down. You want to get a, some of it ahead of the uh, Head of the axle gives it a little bit more stability, okay. but lowering that center of, center of gravity. Because when you load these things up with a lot of, lot of water, it's a lot of weight, mm -hmm. and these rigs can become unstable. On the front of this yeah. is a yellow tank, as right. you can see, and that's more of the traditional tank. Right. And those tanks can, um, can really cause a, a, a lot of weight to come up high. Is that just spray. extra product? Do you have these two tanks then hooked together, or what's the situation? <clears throat> well, actually, this one, this particular applicator, local applicator that, that's brought this in for us, uh, uses that as a separate uh, spray mix. So if, if they're out there and they're uh, running across two different problems products. that they use different uh, herbicide mixes I for, see. they can have that set up. Very good. The you know the beauty of these types of things, it it fits a lot all of our oh, product yeah. line, and so we can use it in a lot of different ways. 
a lot of diverse uses for the products, and this rig will give you a lot of those uses. Now, I noticed the fire extinguisher on here. Is there any other safety concerns a person ought to be, be concerned about when using a rig like this? Well, the safety concerns are stability. Okay. That's the main thing. The yeah. fire um, extinguisher is on there just in case you're out there in the summer. It's very dry and you start a fire. You sure. want to be able to put it out. Right. But Stability of the system, a baffle in the tank, something to keep that water from sloshing around. It gives it a, a lot more stability, is very helpful. But that's the main thing. Yeah. This this type of a piece of equipment, you're kind of locked in there, so if it does roll over, yeah. you're, the, the applicator is well, exposed. Well, and, and speaking of stability, you, bought, you brought a, a little bigger rig with you, didn't you? I didn't bring it with me. <laughs> this is on my wish list. I'm with you. I, uh, this, Basically, you're taking everything that you've got here and you're stepping it up in size. You're bringing over the same kind of equipment. You're bringing it here to a rig where you can haul more water, um, yep. and it gains, uh, you gain greater stability with this tank. Tell type us of about this tank here. Yeah, this tank is a 60 gallon tank. Here we're, we're talking about 15 gallon, mm -hmm. uh, 25 gallon tanks. Uh, here we've got a 60 gallon tank. It is a rectangular tank, but it is set up with a cone bottom oh. so that it drains more readily. Now, this also has heavy-duty suspension. And that's wow. very important when you start looking at the type of rig you want to put this on. That heavy-duty suspension gives it that stability. You load that up with 60 gallons of water, that's <laughs> a lot of weight, yeah. and this rig will handle it, and it'll remain relatively level yeah. so that you don't have to worry about tipping and tilting back. You can right. imagine trying to drive with your with your wheels kind of still bouncing the in boomless the air. system on this on this rig right yes but you also have a couple of booms up front tell us a little bit about yeah. that the system we have here has a fixed boom kind of a traditional fixed boom sure it's not a very large one and it'll flip down yeah and and so then if you can if you bring that down you're you're going to use that for a much narrower path very good you know you have maybe a six foot swath here with this fixed boom that's much lower to the ground something like roadside spring. But um, that back there can spray 15 feet or 15 feet uh, both ways and, and make it 30 feet. Really, so it's really versatile. And, very and versatile. then from a safety standpoint, again, your, your comment about this rig having not only wider uh, suspension, but also the roll bar. The roll bar is a nice feature of this. You know, the, the uh, applicator or the operator is buckled in. Um, and they're, they're buckled in inside that roll cage, and so that makes it a very stable piece of equipment, much safer to operate. And so this, this is going on my wish list. Well, and mine too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. It just demonstrates that you don't have to have big equipment and big tractors. You don't have to choose between that and just hand spraying. There are some options that, that are very, very um, uh, convenient in terms of getting out in some of that rougher country and still getting that weed con weeds control. Thanks yeah. for coming. For more information on using your ATV as a spray rig or the Dow AgriSciences line of range and pasture herbicides, just visit rangeandpasture.com or cattlemantocattlemen.org. And we'll be right back. cost forage and improve grazing access by clearing out weeds and brush with these Dow AgroSciences herbicides. See your Dow AgroSciences representative or visit rangeandpasture.com. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western Wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real And feeding my family a home-cooked meal That's important to me That's important to me and Planting the garden and watching it grow I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Check us out at cattlemantocattleman.org or on Facebook and Twitter. It's deer season savings time. Just in time to get you ready for hay season. 
with 0% financing on John Deere mower conditioners, balers, and select hay tools. Plus, get 0% financing on all John Deere utility tractors up to 140 horsepower. It's the season for savings on hay tools and tractors. Deer season. Be sure to stop by today. Welcome back. We often hear cattlemen say, if you take care of the land and the grass, it will take care of your cattle. And that's really what this business is all about, taking care of the land, optimizing forage production, and ensuring the sustainability of ranching families so we can continue to feed the world. Dow AgriSciences has recognized the best of the best as a longtime sponsor of the Environmental Stewardship Award. Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about the ESAP Award? Absolutely, Kevin. It's a, uh, an honor that goes out to uh, cattlemen across the nation for all of the efforts that they're pouring into uh, conservation on, uh, on their places. It, and, and why has Dow uh, been such a strong supporter for such a long time of that program? Uh, we just feel like it's a very important story to tell to the rest of uh, the, uh, the world. Uh, these folks are out there day in, day out, really taking care of their resources for the long haul, and that's critical to be told. Absolutely. We're fortunate to have Mike D. here with us this week. Mike and his family operate the D. River Ranch near Ellisville, Alabama, and were recognized for their efforts in 2007. Let's learn a little bit more about their stewardship efforts. Visit the 10,000-acre D. River Ranch in West Central Alabama, and you'll find a diverse family operation. Annie D. and her brother Mike worked the ranch together with help from Annie's son Seth, her husband Ed, and their crew. Their livelihood depends on the care they give their 650 cows and their 3,500 acres of cropland. We run a commercial cow-calf operation. We have Brahma Angus cross cattle. We have some purebred Brahmas that we use for seed stock. We get along great and we complement each other in the things that we do. We're trying to do a great job. We're trying to improve all the time. We try to work with people that'll help us improve. D River Ranch was founded in Florida, but with development pressure there, the family sold the original ranch to the state of Florida as part of the Save the Rivers program. Then they moved to Alabama to create the current operation in 1989. This is home, I love it. I don't care if I ever live anywhere else. I'd like to travel, but this is where I want to be and where I want to spend the rest of my life. It's just the neatest place I've ever been. To have the opportunity to work with my sister, we're, we're committed to each other. We're committed to this land and to the farm, and it's, it's neat to know that when I'm out there working hard, I can turn around and somebody's working just as hard as I am. Though drought is a problem now, under normal rainfall, the D River Ranch is at risk for erosion. So the Dees have taken steps to save the soil and protect water resources. They've worked with NRCS to help improve their grazing management and to install GPS systems for precision agriculture. As a matter of fact, last year they had the, the annual uh, precision ag field day here on, on D Farm. And uh, you know, we brought a lot of folks in to look at what's being done out here with, with, with new technology. The way I like to look at them is they're, they're kind of like point farmers. They, people point to them for their ideas and what they're doing. And uh, each year we usually have a field day here. Last year we had one that had over 300 people attend. And I think many of these people just wanted to see what Annie and Mike were doing because they are innovative. D River Ranch has been very cooperative in sharing their production uh, techniques and ideas with area ranchers. And the things that are successful here translates to other areas of the county and the state too. For land the cattle are on, the Ds have added high traffic and heavy use areas to avoid mud and erosion. We've come back in and put erosion control geotextile fabric, and then we've put large stone to hold that fabric down, and then small stone to make it conducive for cattle to handle, to walk across that and make it easier for them. And that has been, that's been able to help us move cattle through those high traffic areas and, and congregation areas. To protect their most fragile lands, the Dees placed 4,000 acres in the Conservation Reserve Program, planting 600 of those acres to trees. 
Traditionally, I'm not a tree hugger, but I think I am a great steward of the land and I'm trying to protect what we have and protect the land and the water, keep it from eroding away. NRCS has been able to come in and help us do some things that we know is the right way to manage this land, to give us some guidance and some assistance in doing some things to protect these fragile areas. Their CRP land has enhanced habitat for wildlife, including white-tailed deer and other species. The Ds are also cooperating with the University of Alabama's Rural Medical Scholars Program, bringing doctors in training to the ranch to gain an understanding of agriculture. I like to show them the combine and the sprayer and the cattle operation and just give them a feel for things that are going on so if somebody shows up at their office and they've had an accident, they have a little bit of understanding about how that could happen. With the stewardship of Annie and Mike D, the land under their care is healthier, their cattle herd is growing, and their effort to make D River Ranch a sustainable operation for the future is on track. D River Ranch is my life. The crops, the cattle, the land, they're not just a job to us, it's our life. We, we're not trying to look at how this crop's gonna come out. We're gonna look at how we can make the next 10 crops or how we can live here and how our cattle operation is gonna grow. I wake up every morning thinking, thank the Lord that I can get up and go to work. We want to make sure that the place is better than we got it and we leave it better than we found it. We know we don't really own this land. We just get to be here for a period of time and we're interested in the water and the soil, the land. We want to make sure that the next folks have a better opportunity even than we have. It's obvious that Mike and his family work hard every single day taking care of the land and their cattle. Mike, I, I'd be interested to know, why do you believe this program, the, the ESAP Award program, is so important to the cattle industry? You know, it was an honor for us to be recognized by our, some of our peers and for this and nominated for this, but really it, was, it gave us an opportunity, it gave us a platform to really promote the things we do. You know, that land is our factory and we're steady all the time working to improve that factory and we're not thinking about the next three or four years. We're thinking about the next three or four generations and, and we're doing everything we possibly can to improve that land and wouldn't dare do anything to harm that land. But it, it takes so much of our effort to, to overcome misconceptions that people have of what, what really is happening in agriculture. It's about like building a reputation in business. You can spend your whole life to build that reputation, but one misconception ruins the whole thing. And so as cattlemen, we have to be very vocal about we are the best use of the land and we're doing everything to improve that land. And, and in our row crops also, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to build and never trying to, to harm in any way, but that's, that's not the, the conception people have out there. What would you say to other cattlemen in terms of, of why you believe they should get involved in this program? Oh, it's, it, it's your story, it's your life, and, and the majority of people that you provide for do not understand where their food comes from. We have the safest, most plentiful food supply in the world right here in this country. After 9-11, people ran for the gas station because they didn't knew that they weren't going to be threatened of, at the grocery store, that we weren't going to be out of food. And so they take that for granted. But, you know, we live it and it's our life, and we have a story to tell the, the general public that this is why you can count on the food supply in the United States. Well, congratulations again to you and your family. You're wonderful examples of the stewardship of many uh, American ranchers and farmers across this country. Well, thank you. We're very proud. To learn more about the Environmental Stewardship Award Program, just visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Seasons change, but year in, year out, year round, it's Crystal Lick season. With specific supplements for weaning stress in fall, protein for free calving in winter, Cabin in spring, and minerals and fly control in summer. For low cost per head per day supplements, every season is Crystal X season. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted.
Welcome back. We spent the last hour discussing forage management, and now it's time to get some final thoughts from our panelists. Daryl, let's start with you. Well, the building blocks of soil health are, and our operation, of course, are zero disturbance, uh, mimicking nature, working with nature, uh, rest and recovery, keeping the land covered, a continual live root at all times with cover crops, mimicking the nature, uh, native range. Uh, you can't emphasize cover enough mm. because that can help with your weeds and your undesirable plants. And we use livestock as a tool. We keep the livestock on the cropland as much as we can and our native rangeland and our tame grass. And it all kind of comes together and um, we're going to move forward with it that way. That's outstanding. Mike, how about you? Uh, you know, as a cattleman today, we've got to do more with the same amount. We've got to be more productive, more efficient, and, and use those practices to, to improve our operation every day. But we can't lose sight that we need to kind of promote our own industry because if we don't toot our own horn and tell our story and tell it the, the right way and the true way, then it's pretty easily misconceived of what we're doing out there. Pat, what would you add? Well, I think that uh, I, I think we just want people to understand that when you're using our products, we're using them as a catalyst. Mm -hmm. We want to move towards a goal. We want to move towards a, a stable, sustainable uh, forage pro a product that that uh, will will last for those generations that Mike once had. And Dave, be aggressive in the development of your forage plan. Mm -hmm. um, pick all the different tools that you've got at your disposal. Get out there, implement it. And uh, if you have any questions or uh, information needs, come visit us, get a hold of one of our sales reps, or visit us at rangeandpasture.com. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights today. You can get more information on Dow AgriSciences and their complete line of range and pasture herbicides by visiting our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. And be sure to join us next week. We'll sit down with the experts from Purina Animal Nutrition to discuss the importance of a proper mineral nutrition program. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.